Shalom Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, a prophetic segment of the broadcast this evening and a very in-depth broadcast to say the least. I think I say that a lot. Anyway, the Vatican's war, or Gog and Magog, we're going to be taking a very serious look, especially towards the end of the broadcast on this subject here. Before I get into the broadcast, let me just remind you, those of you that uh, do like this broadcast, want to be a part of this ministry to support this ministry, please do so. You can do so by visiting either website, israelinewslive.org, where there is a donation place you can donate online, or you can go to israelreturns.com. On that site there, you can actually, we have under contacts, if you prefer to mail a check uh, to us in the Czech Republic, you can do so, or you can also give online under this area as well. We greatly appreciate your support, and thank you, and God bless you for that. Uh, moving right on in, let's get directly into this broadcast because it is very lengthy tonight. I want to start off, we are looking at the Middle East crisis. We are looking at how this is coming to pass, what is happening, the events that are transpiring right now in and around Europe. Uh, excuse me, in and around um, the Middle East. It's a very hot bed. There is a supposedly a ceasefire that is supposed to take effect. Uh, I highly doubt that it will. And what you're going to hear tonight is probably something you've never heard before about Gog and Magog and how it will transpire and how the events that you're seeing are actually those events that are, that are proving who Gog really is. We're going to talk about that this evening, so I hope you have the patience to stick with us. Uh, starting off in this, the reason, one of the reasons why I call it the Vatican's War, because we know the Pope of Rome is over all uh, spiritual and political powers of the world, also as well as NATO. He is over the head of, the, the head of NATO forces there. Uh, this was a very interesting thing I caught today, though. I spent the entire day in research today for this. Uh, there is a the former uh, Turkish justice minister, Sami Turk, uh, back in 24, made this statement about the Vatican. He said, the church is the world's most powerful organization. The papacy is run in strict, top-down, hierarchical order. In Islam, however, there is no institution akin to the papacy, Turk told Al Monitor. I just thought that was fascinating that the former uh, Justice Minister of Turkey made that kind of comment about uh, the Vatican itself. But another man that made a lot of comments about the Vatican was none other than Alberta Rivera, who was a former Jesuit uh, living in Spain. He was, this is where he, he uh, had, uh, was part of the pap, uh, excuse me, the Vatican's uh, papacy at that time. Uh, he had a lot to say about the Catholic Church. He studied under Cardinal B. He later had given his life to Yeshua, became a believer, a, I believe a staunch Pentecostal believer, uh, once he had gotten saved. And this is some of the things that I wanted to share with you that he says about the Catholic Church, I think is very important in light of the events that are happening in the Middle East. Uh, he said here, what I'm going to tell you is what I learned in secret briefings in the Vatican when I was a Jesuit priest under oath and introduction, uh, excuse me, and induction. A Jesuit cardinal named Augustine B. showed us how desperately the Roman Catholics wanted Jerusalem at the end of the third century. Because of its religious history and its strategic location, the holy city was considered a priceless treasure. And keep this in mind now. This is a former Jesuit. Many people are aware of uh, Alberto Rivera. Uh, he was believed to be murdered by the Catholic Church. No proof for that, but they believe that he actually had him killed. He stated also a scheme had to be developed to make Jerusalem a Roman Catholic city. The great untapped source of manpower that could do this job was the children of Ishmael. The poor Arabs fell victim to one of the most clever plans ever devised by the powers of darkness. That's what Alberta Rivera had to say uh, about the Catholic Church. Now I'm going to give you a few more insights of what he said because we're seeing the same thing repeat in history. He also stated Augustine became the Bishop of North Africa and was effectively effective in winning Arabs to Roman Catholicism including whole tribes. It was among these Arab converts the Catholicism, uh, that the concept of looking for an Arab prophet developed. 
And this is what Cardinal B had taught Alberta Rivera uh, as a Jesuit priest learning under this Cardinal, Cardinal uh, B. B-E-A is how you spell his name. Muhammad's father died from illness, and the sons born to great Arab families in place, places like Mecca were sent into the desert to be suckled and weaned and spend some of their childhood with Bedouin tribes for training and to avoid the plagues in the cities because of the great plague that was going on during that day. After his mother and grandfather also died, Muhammad was with his uncle when a Roman Catholic monk learned of his identity and said, take your brother's son back to his country and guard him against the Jews. For by God, if they see him and know of him, that which I know, they will construe evil against him. Great things are in store for his brother's son of yours. The Roman Catholic monk, monk had fanned the flames for future Jewish persecution at the hands of the followers of Muhammad. You see, that's the exact same thing we see happening today. The Catholic Church is still inciting the flames of violence as it was back during this time when a Catholic monk said this about Muhammad as a young man. What are they doing today? Cardinal Jean Taran said there will be no peace in Jerusalem if the situation of the holy sites is not dealt with. And that's quoted by Giulio Miotti in an article that he wrote in 2011. And again in 2015, the cardinal again stated the same thing. There will be no peace in Jerusalem until all the security of the holy sites is, is resolved, meaning that the Catholic Church gets full autonomy, autonomy over the entire old city. Now, according to uh, different, different spokesmen there in uh, the Temple Institute, it seems that Jerusalem is not under Israeli control, so it's either under Jordanian or Vatican control nonetheless. All right, now let's look on further what he says here. That is Alberto Rivera, the former Jesuit of the Catholic Church. He said the Vatican desperately wanted Jerusalem because of its religious significance, but was blocked by the Jews. Another problem was the true Christians in North Africa who preached the gospel. Roman Catholicism was growing in power, but would not tolerate opposition. That sounds interesting, doesn't it? Even the Protestant Reformation went against the Catholic Church, and many of them died as a result. But the, the, the Christians in Northern Africa, by the way, were the early Jewish believers. Those believers that did not go along with Constantine. Anyway, it says, now this is what Cardinal, uh, excuse me, Alberto Rivera is saying. This is not my words, this is his words. Somehow the Vatican had to create a weapon to eliminate both the Jews and the true Christian believers who refused to accept Roman Catholicism. Looking to North Africa, they saw the multitudes of Arabs as a source of manpower to do their dirty work. Yes, they did. Some Arabs had become Roman Catholic and could be used in reporting information to leaders in Rome. Others were used in an underground spy network to carry out Rome's master plan to control the great multitude of Arabs who rejected Catholicism. I don't think it's changed any different. Do you not know that the Catholic Church is considered one of the greatest spy resources for the CIA and the Mossad as well? There is a man that has done many videos about the relationship, the close relationship between the Vatican and the Mossad. I can attest to this for a fact. I had a very close relationship with two people who are part of Israeli's secret service there. And when I began to speak against the Vatican and say how that Israel was actually, uh, through, especially through Shimon Peres, was giving over the old city to, to the Vatican, uh, there were Jewish uh, government people like Shimon Peres that were doing this. They come against me with such a venom of hatred and all kinds of lies and propaganda has been spread about me as a result and still continues on. We even had a Catholic infiltrator in our own ministry that as well has tried to derail everything because once you stand for the truth, believe me, Satan will come against you. When St. Augustine appeared in the scene, he knew what was going on. His monasteries served as bases to seek out and destroy Bible manuscripts owned by the true Christians. Now this is Alberto Rivera saying this. Very fascinating to say the least. He mentioned a woman by the name of Kaji. Kaji, by the way, 
was an Arabic woman who had given huge sums of her fortune over to the Catholic Church when she became a Catholic herself and actually lived in a monastery very much like the nuns do today. Kaji was to find a brilliant young man who could be used by the Vatican to create a new religion and become the Messiah for the children of Ishmael. Is that not interesting? Does that not sound familiar with today when they talk about the Mahdi, the Antichrist that will come out of Islam? Well, of course, you have to remember the Catholic Church wrote the Quran, so that's one major issue, and this is something that is also uh, reported by Alberto Rivera. Anyway, Kaji had a cousin named uh, Waraka, who was also a very uh, faithful Roman Catholic, and the Vatican placed him in a critical role as Muhammad's advisor. He had tremendous influence on Muhammad. Teachers were sent to young Muhammad, and he had intensive training. Muhammad studied the works of St. Augustine, which prepared him for his great calling. The Vatican and Catholic Arabs across North Africa spread the story of a great one who was about to rise up among the people and the chosen one of their God. This is how the Vatican was able to get the Arabic world to believe they had a coming prophet. They were grooming Muhammad. He, in fact, it was reported that he went into all kinds of visions and trances. In fact, his own wife, Kaji, who ended up marrying Muhammad, said that he had, it was like he was possessed of a demon. Very, very fascinating. Very fascinating. Anyway, Alberto Rivera, the former Jesuit, watch, what, watch what, what he says here. The Vatican wanted to create a messiah for the Arabs, someone they could raise up as a great leader, a man with charisma whom they could train and eventually unite all the non-Catholic Arabs behind him, creating a mighty army that would ultimately capture Jerusalem for the Pope. Sound familiar? Isn't it interesting, as I mentioned in another, in another broadcast, that back in uh, 2011, when Jean Torron actually made the statement, I believe it was in December the 15th of 2011, he made the statement that, uh, that there would be no peace in Jerusalem until, that, until the issue of all the holy sites was resolved for the Vatican. And three days later, Hillary Clinton is getting a, uh, two uh, emails from her aides telling her that she could, should incite among the uh, uh, Palestinian women a protest to get the Jews back to the negotiating table. You see, the, the Catholic Church has always used the Arabic people against the Jews as well against true believers. They're still doing it to this day. It doesn't change, it's still the same. Well, I think the Pope has finally got his new man, his new Arabic leader, his new Mahdi. Remember the Catholic Church wrote their book. They, they spread all over the world that there was coming according to what, uh, uh, the, from what Alberto Rivera said, they were spreading all over the, the Arabic world back in those days that there was coming a prophet. Just like they've done today. They have brought their, their, their charismatic leaders into the different churches today, spreading that there is going to be an Arabic Antichrist. Sound familiar? That's why even there, uh, I know that Walid Shubat is actually promoting that Erdogan is the Antichrist. Now, I don't agree with Walid on that, but he has a right to his opinion. But nonetheless, this type of doctrine has been spread throughout all the ecumenical movements and has become a major issue that there would be a Muslim Antichrist. Why? It's to take your attention off the man in white and put it on the guy in black. That's exactly what it is. And the Vatican has had that strong relationship with the Muslim community all these years because they created it from the Arabic community. They created uh, the, the, this, this whole thing. That's why you see in Psalm 83 when it speaks about, um, uh, let me just take you to it really quick here. Psalm 83, keep thou not silent, O God, hold thy, not thy peace and be not still. Be, be not still, O God, for lo, your enemies make a tumult, in other words, an uprising, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They've raised up their leader. Now, I've always argued that that's the Pope, but they may be also, it could also be a compound meaning that they raise up Erdogan as that leader, right? Now, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people, that's the Jewish people, and consulted against thy hidden ones, sefanecha, that's the word for hidden ones. That's the, the two witnesses. They know those two witnesses are coming. 
They have said, come let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. All of the Arabic nations are wanting to do this. See, for they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee, against God himself. The tabernacles of Adam. That's the, that's the Christian churches that are united back under Catholicism because Adam is Rome. That's clearly seen in the book of Obadiah and other places as well. Ezekiel 35 also shows that that Adam or Esau is the Catholic church. Obadiah clearly says it and so does Daniel. Daniel said that the, that the prince, or excuse me, uh, yes, the prince that shall come would be of the people who destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, which was none other than Titus, the Roman general. And some people say, well, it was the Syrians that actually did it. God held Titus just as guilty when he said you stood aloof as one of them. That makes you an accomplice, sure enough. So yes, he may have not done the dirty work the Syrians did, but uh, we don't see that, you don't see Bashar al-Assad as the Antichrist. It's, it's Erdogan that they're trying to make to be that guy. They're trying to fake an Antichrist by putting in a, a Muslim Mahdi. But notice also, the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites. What, is, what did he say that he would do? What, what did uh, uh, Alberta Rivera say? They wanted to get the Ishmaelites to create a religion to wipe out Judaism and the true Christians. They've been nearly about successful. Now, the battle is not over yet. Anyway, let me share with you some things that we found also as we've been doing some research on this here. This happened here on February 4th. It was reported under Turkey uh, in, in Cyprus.com. Now, by the way... Um, this, uh, this was an Arabic website. I, I, I used uh, Google Translate to try to, to, to bring this article out. It says, Turkey returned its ambassador. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I apologize. No, this one was not. It's a different one that I worked on that's Arabic. Uh, this here is on in, in Cyprus.com on February 4th. Turkey returned its ambassador to the Vatican on Thursday, nearly 10 months after withdrawing him in protest against Pope Francis' desc uh, description of the century-old massacre of Christians, Armenians, as genocide. Now, you have to understand, that's always a play. It was nothing but a front to make it look like the Catholic Church didn't have a good relationship with Erdogan. They've had good relations ever since and never changed. It's always been that way. You have to remember that, that it is the, the, the Turkey is nothing but a puppet to whatever the Pope says. And of course, the Pope leads it, but he uses the United States as a spokesman to Turkey there. Watch what Bashar al-Assad had to say here. Uh, this was the article here on globalsecurity.org that we translated from the Arabic language uh, through Google Translate. It says, Turkey wants ground troops in Syria. Syria's, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad said Monday that both countries have long wanted to send troops into his country. Now, he's talking about Turkey and Saudi Arabia. He said they long wanted to send troops into his country. He accused them of being directed by powers abroad and said they are only followers that carry out orders. The Saudis and the Turkish government. Now the Saudis don't seem like they obey anybody, do they? But they do. They as well, like Turkey, have to bow down to the Pope of Rome. And in fact, the Pope of Rome has been to both countries, both Turkey and Saudi Arabia. According to uh, uh, Cardinal, excuse me, uh, uh, Alberto Rivera, the former Jesuit, he stated that Cardinal B, it is a long-standing thing with the Vatican that when the Pope of Rome goes to a country, it's because that country has been conquered and submissive to the will of Rome. Now, you might want to make a notation of this because the Pope has never been to Russia in its entire history. Never. As far as I'm aware of, perhaps not Iran either, but I could not confirm it as far as Iran. Now, that doesn't make those two nations great nations. I'm just saying they haven't, he, hasn't been, he hasn't conquered it yet. Uh, America created Al-Qaeda and the ISIS terror group. Now, I, I wanted to bring this out. Under, on, this was on Global Research reported back in September 19, 2014. Why? Because remember, uh, Assad was saying that outside forces are the ones controlling what's going on in his country. Much like Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State ISIS is made in the USA, an instrument of terror designed to divide and conquer the oil-rich Middle East and to conquer Iran's growing influence in the region. 
the fact that the United States has a long and torrid history of backing terrorist groups will surprise only those who watch the news and ignore history. Thought you might want to have that just for a little insight there. Now, looking at it from a scriptural standpoint, remember, what this, this whole thing where ISIS has been created by the United States, it has caused one of the most, the worst humanitarian crisis as well as refugees, the largest refugee crisis in the world's history, which is none other than a biblical uh, fulfillment as well, as we brought out many times in the past, uh, here in the last months here. In Micah chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, it says, In that day also he shall come even to thee from Assyria, now, Syria, by the way, the Assyrian Empire contained Syria, modern-day Syria, as well as northwest Iraq. Okay, and from the fortified cities, and from the fortress, even to the river, from sea to sea, and from mountain to mountain. And this is talking about how they're going to come in against Israel. But then he throws in a little interesting thing for you to know when that timing comes in verse 13. Notwithstanding... The land shall be desolate. What land? The land that they're crossing to get to Israel. Because of them that dwell therein for the fruit of their doing. Because of them. In other words, because of the people that live in the land. In other words, like Syria, Iraq, all those places right there where they're going to use, they're going to use that as a launching pad to get to Israel, to get to the mountains of Israel. Okay, but they make that land desolate because of the people that are dwelling there. ISIS and the moderate rebel forces that are backed by the United States. ISIS is a strong backer of, uh, of uh, or excuse me, Turkey is a strong backer of the ISIS militants. They supply them. The Saudis are the ones that give all the money to be able to buy the weapons for ISIS. And the United States is backing the Syrian rebels as well as has trained the ISIS militants as well. And the Bible says that the land shall be desolate because of them that dwell therein. They took the locals, not to mention bringing in people from Afghanistan and other places, but they have used the own local Arabic population to go against Bashar al-Assad, and the whole land has become desolate. The very land that they're going to use to come against Israel with as a launching pad. You see, so Israel is becoming complacent as a result of all the battles on their border. And that's what's going to make Israel an easier target. They're too complacent. They're used to the bombings. They're used to the attacks that are going on across the border. But you're going to find out something in a few minutes about Ezekiel 38 you may not have thought about before. Let's continue on. We're about halfway through now. Not quite halfway yet. U.S. trained ISIS forces at Secret Jordan Base. This was under truthandaction.org. WND also brought this out. The Jordanian official said all ISIS members who received U.S. training to fight in Syria were first vetted for any link to the extremist group like Al-Qaeda. In February of 2012, WND was the first to report the U.S., Turkey, and Jordan were running a training base for the Syrian rebels in the Jordanian town of Safwaya in the country's northern desert region. Now, thanks to ISIS and thanks to the United States and, and Turkey and all of them uh, doing a great job in training them, you know, they also needed weapons. And as they did a great job, they finally got a rewarded uh, when we find out back in June 24th of 2014 when ISIS was able to overthrow a, a, a base, an Iraqi base there uh, near Mosul, Nineveh, that area right there. They overthrew the base there. And what did they do? They captured all this heavy United States equipment. The Pentagon is alarmed. It says in the report that the Islamic state of Iraq and Syria has captured dozens of U.S. Humvees, tanks, weapons, which uh, the militants are now sending to Syria. He, the, the advanced U.S. weaponry that is now in possession of the ISIS can change the groups standing in Syria, especially among the other rebel groups fighting in the country, including Al-Qaeda and Al-Nursa Front. The Humvees and tanks will also strengthen the group in its fight against Bashar al-Assad's forces in Damascus. You see, the U.S. wanted this to happen. They could have stopped it. Easily they could have stopped it. It was no problem for the United States to stop it. They've got military bases everywhere. If the Iraqis could not fend them off, all they had to do was call in an airstrike, and they would have wiped them out. 
Now, another thing that's interesting to know as well, according to military officials, you don't just go in there and start up these vehicles without codes. You don't just go in there and fire off a rocket launcher without a system of codes. That's why it says advanced U.S. weaponry. The tanks are the same. You have to know the codes. Who gave them the codes? Very interesting, isn't it? To say the least. Prophecy of Nahum was being fulfilled at this time as well. Chapter 3, verse 7. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, uh, Nineveh, or Mosul, same place, is laid waste. Who will bemoan her when shall I seek comforters for thee? By the way, it's not fulfilled as of yet. It's only the beginning of it. Turkey's gone into this area as well, crossed the border into Iraqi uh, 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 area there. We already know this has happened here a few months ago. Uh, it's been a big issue. Russia was willing to fight against Turkey if they didn't get out. Uh, and it's still coming up. It's not over with yet. You can count on it. Because the United States is already saying that, the, that there's a plan B because they don't believe that this truce is going to hold. Of course not. They're using the, 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 uh, this whole issue of a ceasefire to rearm ISIS. So Turkey and Saudis can get them all beefed up and ready to go. And if that doesn't work, Turkey and Saudi Arabia is going to come in. And by the way, the Saudis just landed jets into Turkey as well, ready for a fight against Russia. Nam also in chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, this is dealing with the, uh, uh, with the uh, the refugee crisis that, that, that has happened as a result of what's going on in the, uh, quote, Assyrian province there, uh, which is both countries. It says here in verse uh, chapter 3, verse 18, Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. So the Syrian refugee crisis is never going to end. Understand, you're seeing prophecy coming out. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap the hands over thee, for upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually. Now, as I'm seeing these things come to pass, I'm more and more concerned Russia is not going to win this battle coming up. It's going to go in NATO's favor. It reminds me of Nathan's... Uh, near-death experience when he mentioned this as well. It'll be about a two-week war with Russia and the United States. That will happen when Russia goes to war with Turkey and the United States is forced to come in there to help their ally. It's all just a play. And Russia, don't think that Russia is not just in this for the, for the money as well. They are. And there will become a peace agreement, but at that point there, all the players will be in place. All the players. Now, let's take a look at more of what it has to say here. Now, this is on TASS, Russian news agency, the English section, TASS.ru forward slash EN on February 24th, 2016. Moscow accuses Turkey of hiding illegal activity near the border. See, Turkey is trying to hide illegal activities near the border with Syria by denying a Russian observation flight over its territory, Russian foreign ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova said on Thursday. Turkey's putting troops there ready for an invasion into Syria. And of course, you've already heard Russia said that they're going to go home, or not Russia, but uh, the, the, this Bashar al-Assad said they'll all go home in coffins if they do. Hmm. Russia's role is vital to Syrian truce, but has Plan B, John Kerry says, according to RT.com on the 24th as well, yesterday. The U.S. is discussing Plan B options should the Syrian ceasefire and political transition fail, Secretary of State John Kerry told a Senate committee while praising Moscow's crucial role in brokering the agreement reached by U.S. and Russia. Now, while, there, while Kerry says this, the United States is all praising John Kerry uh, for getting this whole thing going and his relentless efforts for bringing about a peace process. It was Russia that initiated this, not John Kerry. There is a significant discussion taking place now about a plan B in the event that we do not succeed the negotiating table, Kerry said while giving testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on Tuesday. Russia doesn't go over well. That went over like a lead balloon with him. Russian officials call talks of Plan B for Syria a dangerous trend. Again, TASS reporting today. Reports of Plan B on for Syria is very dangerous trend, which is similar to the situation with Minsk two agreements on Ukraine settlement. Chairman of Russia's Federation Council, International Affairs Committee, Konstantin uh, Koshkovov, 
told a conference on the uh, Vladi Discussion Club titled Middle East uh, from Violence to Safety. The fact that someone talk, talks about Plan B appeared now seems a very dangerous trend to me, he said. This is somewhat reminiscent of the situation the Minsk agreements with the responsibility for their implementation placed entirely on Russia, even though Ukraine does not comply with them. We're going to see that again. And again, we're going to find out that it's not going to be Russia that doesn't comply with it. We're going to find out it's going to be Turkey. It's going to be NATO's allies that don't comply with it. But they'll find some way to blame Russia. You can count on it. Again, I can't say that Russia is the innocent people in the whole scenario. They're all going to come against Israel. That's, the, that's really the end game of this. And this is what God will, this will, will, will anger the God of Israel is when they all come against his people. Now, 1,600 British troops, in case you're not aware of this, uh, are, have already headed to, well, they're already in Jordan now. 1,600 British soldiers. This is reported by The Telegraph on February the 7th of 2016. The logistics war game in Jordan aims, now watch this, their logistics war game in Jordan aims to ensure the army can still deploy a 30,000 strong force of tanks and troops to crisis zone anywhere in the world despite sharp def defense cuts in the past five years. Exercise Shamal Storm could be dry run for one day having to send a large armored force for British troops to Eastern Europe if there was ever a Russian confrontation with NATO sources set. Now, how stupid of a strategy is this? They're using Jordan as their exercise ground for Eastern Europe? That's pretty dumb. That's about as stupid of an excuse I've ever heard. And that kind of lets me know that what the 1,600 soldiers are there for is to be able to receive a contingency of 30,000 with tanks and armors and everything else. There's your plan B. They've been planning plan B before the talks could even get going between John Kerry and President Putin. Very, or, or excuse me, Foreign, uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. It's not only that, though. Britain is also involved with the Saudis on this. Uh, this here is in Gulf Magazine. It's an Arabic uh, newspaper. It was not in English. Again, this was one that we uh, used Google to be able to help translate it. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Naif bin uh, Abdelaziz, Deputy Prime Minister of the Interior, discussed with the head of Defense Committee at the British Parliament, James Gray, a number of issues, mutual concern between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Britain during a meeting at his Interior Ministry office in Riyadh on Monday. By the way, this happened on February 22nd. This is just a few days ago, all right? During the meeting, the Crown Prince underscored the importance of cons cons consolidating the firm relations between the two friendly countries to best serve the common interest of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Britain. No wonder why British troops are there in Jordan and are expecting their 30,000 strong to come in as well. The Saudis are ready to make a ground invasion, and they want to do an overwhelming force to throw Russia off guard. I, I hope President Putin at least listens to this. Maybe he'll realize what he's up against. And I don't think the Iranians are going to be helpful enough to do anything about it. But this is where we get into Michael Snyder's report. Michael Snyder uh, from the website, the, the Economic Collapse, has got some very interesting thoughts here. I can't say that nukes will be used. I really don't think that's what's going to happen because the whole idea of nukes being used really would downplay what I think the ultimate goal is and that's to try to, to, to topple Israel. But, there again, they could be used, but maybe not on the places you think. You may try to use it on the United States. Remember, there are wars and rumors of wars according to Yeshua from Matthew 24. Kingdom will rise against kingdom and nation against nation. These are the kingdoms rising against each other. Kingdom against kingdom and nation against nation. Right now, the Turkish and Saudi Arabia kingdoms have got to come against Bashar al-Assad's kingdom before we can have nation against nation, and that's where Russia will come into play against the United States. It'll go just the order the way Yeshua said it, Jesus, for those who don't know who I'm talking about. World War III could very easily turn into a very first nuclear war in the Middle East, says Michael Snyder. Saudi Arabia already has nukes. Iran probably does. The Russia, Russia, by the way, Iran does. Uh, we uh, already know as well a good friend of mine that interviewed 
one of Iran's scientists that clearly said that they have three atomic bombs uh, in Iran. This has been a couple of years ago. Uh, Saudi Arabia already has nukes. Iran probably does. And the Russians are one of the two great nuclear powers on the entire planet. So if Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and their Sunni allies do decide to conduct a full-blown ground invasion of Syria, could someone ultimately decide to use nuclear weapons when their backs get pushed up against a wall? As you read this, as you read this article, there are thousands of military vehicles and hundreds of thousands of troops massed along the southern border of Turkey and the northern border uh, of Saudi Arabia, if the command is given and those forces start streaming toward Damascus, it is inevitable that the Syrian, Iranian Hezbollah, and the Russians would fight back. It would literally be the start of World War III. And also we know that the United States has got this huge thing coming up in March, uh, uh, March the 7th, their huge uh, uh, military drill with South Korea. Now, why why is there a big military drill with South Korea? And of course, their drill is dealing with going into South, uh, North Korea as a country already defeated. Why is that? Why is that kind of drill being conducted? Why is North Korea such a strategic issue in relation to the Middle East? I'll tell you why. Because North Korea is the one, one of the main countries that worked with the Iranians to help develop nuclear weapons. And the United States and their allies know that if there comes a war in the Middle East, then North Korea is going to attack South Korea as a diversion. Believe me, they're working together on both sides. They all know what's going on, and that's what would happen. So that's why they're preparing over there what's going on. Now, same article, Michael Snyder says, if the, if the first started flying in Syria and Russia and Iran decided to start bombing Saudi air bases, would Saudi Arabia resort to using their nukes? Let's hope not, he says. In the event of a massive ground invasion by Saudi Arabia, Turkey and the Allies, it's actually more likely that Russia may decide to be the first one to use nukes. An invasion force of hundreds of thousands of troops would vastly outnumber the relatively a small Russian force that is already inside Syria. And so the Russians may feel that the only way that they can keep the Sunni powers out of Damascus is to use tactical nukes. Now, a tactical nuke is not a full-blown nuke, by the way. And Russia may not only do it here in the Middle East, but he may also do it against the United States. Because that's when the United States is going to get involved. And when they get involved, we may see some nuclear bombs back and forth for a little bit. Robert Perry, and this is actually quoted too uh, in the same article that Michael Snyder did, but uh, I want to make sure we brought it up. Robert Perry, author of America's Stolen Narrative, states this in his book, A source close to the Russian President Vladimir Putin told me that the Russians have warned Turkish President uh, Tiepi Erdogan that Moscow is prepared to use tactical nuclear weapons if necessary to save their troops in the face of a Turkish-Saudi onslaught. Since Turkey is a member of NATO, any such conflict could quickly escalate into a full-scale nuclear confrontation. We see that was, of course, that was his book on the thing there. This is Robert here in the picture here. Given Erdogan's uh, megalo megalomania and mental instability and aggressiveness and ex inexperience of Saudi Prince Mohammed bin Salam, defense minister and son of King Salama, the only person who probably can stop a Turkish-Saudi invasion is President Obama. But I'm told that he has been unwilling to flatly prohibit such an intervention, uh, though he has sought to calm Erdogan down and made clear that the U.S. military would not join the invasion. This is only a play. Only a play. They will join it. The United States, is, the United States has already committed 10,000 troops to the Saudi-led uh, uh, invasion. The U.S. has the troops already in Iraq. They're ready to go with it. All right. Now, continuing on right here, um, Michael says here, it had been hoped that a ceasefire could be negotiated that would at least temporarily defuse tensions in Syria. Unfortunately, it does not look like the shooting is going to stop, and this is going to put immense pressure on both Saudi Arabia and Turkey to do something to rescue the radical Sunni militants that are on the verge of defeat. The Saudis, the Turks, and their allies have poured enormous amounts of money and resources into the war over the past five years, and now they are faced with the choice of either accepting defeat or directly intervening in this conflict themselves, and that's basically because Russia has turned the tide of this. 
Now, friends, it's time to take a serious look at Ezekiel 38. And we're getting close to closing of, of this broadcast. In Ezekiel 38, looking at verse 3 and 4 to start with. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now, one thing that really stood out about this to me, when we look at Gog and Magog, a lot of people think of this as being Russia. I did myself for a long time. And then one day when we hear the testimony of the NDE, uh, Nathan, the little young man uh, in Israel there, it changed some opinions of people. In fact, a man that I know personally that has done enormous amount of research on Gog and Magog is now convinced that the young man is right, that the United States, Obama, is indeed the representation of Gog. And as he put it, pointed out to me, he said, if, Steve, he ends up becoming the head of the United Nations, he will definitely be in the land of the North at that time. Now, if he's in the land of the North by being in the United Nations, which you can put that as in Geneva, Switzerland there, you have to remember the head of the UN and all the UN forces is the Roman Catholic Church nonetheless. It's still the Vatican's army. The United Nations forces is the Vatican's army None, none the, in, in all of this, all right? But here's what's interesting. Right now, Russia is in Syria. Really, the only ally that Russia has in this whole confrontation could be Iran, perhaps uh, not Lebanon per se, but uh, Hezbollah there, and of course, China would also be their ally. This here says, though, plainly, I will turn back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with sorts of ar all sorts of armor, a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them handling swords. Now you're going to find out in just a minute, minute, it's not just one nation alone what we're looking at in Ezekiel 38. It's many nations. That's why I notice what it says right here in the verse, with all sorts of armor. All sorts of armor. So I took the time to kind of give you a little look at that. All of them clothed with all sorts of armor. The British army, the French army, different, different types. The Turkish army, the German army. See? <laughs> By the way, that's out, of, that's out of spot there. Let me go right down here. Saudi, the United States, they all got different types of armor and clothing and stuff. Every one of them, different. None of them are the same. And I think this is exactly what Ezekiel is looking at when he sees this. Now, as reading on here, watch what it says here. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togma of the north quarters and all his bands, and many people with thee, be thou prepared and prepared for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. This is where it gets interesting right there. Be thou a guard unto them. All right. After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains, uh, against the mountains of Israel. Now, this, we know it's speaking of the children of Israel coming back to their homeland, the land that was brought back from the sword, okay, because they were taken out by, by the, uh, by the uh, uh, Romans, by Titus, the Roman general, they were killed and slaughtered and everything out and driven out. But in this case here, they're coming, they're, this is going to happen in the latter days when Gog and Magog and all of his bands are coming together. See, all of his bands. This is a NATO force. This is all these countries coming into the Middle East that are coming in there. And they come up against the mountains of Israel. Jordan, Syria. That's where the mountains of Israel are. Remember what I told you in the, in, in the scriptures of Micah? Micah 7? It also, Micah, I wish I had put this in the, in, the, in the thing so you can see it, but so you just have to listen to me as I read this to you. Micah chapter 7. What does it say here? 
Verse 8, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, shall I arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will, shall be a light unto me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. That's Israel. Then she that is mine enemy shall see it, and shame shall cover her, which said unto me, Where is the Lord thy God? Mine eyes shall behold her. Now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. She, who does the she represent here? That's the Roman Catholic Church. See, the she always represents like a bride, in other words. And the Catholic Church claims to be the bride of Yeshua, she says, I sit as a widow, and I shall see no, no sorrow, no death. All right? So it says, Mine eyes shall behold her, now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. In the day that thy walls are to be built, in that day shall the decree be far removed. In that day also he shall come even to thee from Assyria. That's the armies. That, this is Ezekiel 38. And from the fortified cities and from the fortress, even to the river, and from the sea to sea, even from the mountain to mountain. See, what does it say in Ezekiel 38? After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. Now it's kind of like he's just injecting that thought in there. You're coming back from the, 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 you know, from the land that, that you come, excuse me. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. That's because the Jews are gathered from all over the world, all the different nations, against the mountains of Israel. So see, what it's showing is that the battle is coming up against the mountains of Israel, but it shows you the time frame. Ezekiel injects that in there. If you're watching it carefully, Ezekiel is only injecting that in there. He's injecting to show you the time frame that it happens in the latter days when what? When Israel has been gathered from around the world and they're back in their homeland and they're coming, this, this soldiers that are coming up a part of God's battle, they come up against the mountains of Israel. Now they haven't crossed those mountains as of yet, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. That's the Jews. But this battle group has come up against the mountains of Israel. So through the land of Assyria and also through the land of Jordan. All right? There's one reason why we see in the Bible, I think it's in Isaiah 24, or no, it's not Isaiah 24, I forget where it's at, that I brought this up not long ago, that Jordan ends up getting beat pretty bad in a, in a battle. All right? Now, they come up, but watch what he says, notwithstanding, now this is going back to Micah, and that day also he shall come even to thee from Assyria and from fortified cities, and from the fortress even to the river, from the sea to sea, and from mountain to mountain. Again, just like it is in Ezekiel. Notwithstanding, the land shall be desolate because of them that dwell therein for the fruit of their doings. What land is desolate? That's the Assyria land. That's Nineveh. That's all of modern-day Syria has become desolate because what did they do? Before they brought their armies in here, into this land here, they had to wipe everything out. This is another reason. It's not just to go in there to take the oil of the land. They literally wanted to wipe out the inhabitants so they could bring all these world forces on Israel's borders. This is why they've taken over Bashar al-Assad's territory. So that God could bring down all of his forces and not be hindered by the inhabitants of the land. You're seeing prophecy being fulfilled right before your eyes. Now watch what he says here. Verse, th verse 9. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Russia's not got a whole bunch of bands that they brought with them. Come on, people, wake up. Let's see what the truth is about this. Did you see Russia come down with a lot of countries to back them up? No. That's why I don't think, I, I, I've kind of wondered if Russia might not win this battle. But I don't think Russia's going to. Because they come in. That's even like in Daniel. In Daniel, they come in like a flood. That king of the north, he gets sick and tired and he sends in a huge wave. See, the Pope of Rome has trouble from the tidings in the east. 
Do you not think the Pope ain't stupid? Let me tell you something. That's why he's got the United States military over there planning on a huge uh, military drill over there in South Korea right now. And believe me, they're getting ready to deal with North Korea. And they got plenty of military to deal just in case they get afraid that China gets out of control. They're worried about the tidings in the east as well. But they're wiping out all of this land of, of Syria. Why? To bring all their NATO forces in there to attack Israel. To fulfill Ezekiel 38. Now, now you got to watch now. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. But watch what happens. Now there's a pause. They get there and then there's a short pause. Okay? That's what I titled here. There is a pause if you were, if you were, but, if, if, if you were, but, but very short. Watch what he says in verse 10. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass. He also come to pass. There's a pause. He gets all of his troops in there. Then the Bible says it shall also come to pass that at the same time, in other words, while the troops are still there, at the same time shall things come into thy mind or into your mind and you shall think an evil thought. In other words, you're already there. You get there, you're already there. You did the battle with Russia. You conquered Syria. You got Bashar al-Assad out of power. Remember I said that in a video not long ago. I found a prophecy. I forget where it was. Now, some of you will remember it. Maybe you can put it in the comments for the other people. I said there's a prophecy, and I give it to you on one of the videos there, that Bashar al-Assad has prophesied that he's going to be taken out of, the, out of power. And I said I believe he'll be killed in the battle or some kind of, he'll be, he'll be murdered. This is why they're getting Bashar al-Assad out of this whole region there. You know, I have really kind of held back. You guys know it. I have I've kind of hinted about Ezekiel 38, but I wouldn't talk about Ezekiel 38. Not until God has finally revealed to me what's going on. All right? So that at the same time shall things come into mind. Thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. I think that is modern day Israel. Now, Brother Kellen and I have actually talked about this as being a possible future battle of Gog and Magog after the millennial reign. But in this case here, it could have a compound meaning as well. But I say this because even today, Israel, it's no longer like the old city that's got a gigantic wall around it or like the Vatican that has a gigantic wall around their city. You know, this is now a nation where the cities are open. But watch what he says. Thou shalt say, I will go up again in the land of unwalled villages, and I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. It doesn't say anything about not having a military. They just don't have gates and walls. To take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn thy hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited. Because why? Israel was desolate, but now it's inhabited. And upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of, that, of the land. Israel does have cattle. That's kind of interesting too if you think about it because they brought in the red heifer uh, the Temple Institute did. So that's really, there's your cattle right there. They brought in the red heifer for being able to restart the sacrificial service. I'm against that. I believe Isaiah is too in chapter 66, I believe it is. Ezekiel 38, 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish. And by the way, if you want to know where Sheba is and Dedan, Sheba is actually in Yemen. Dedan is Saudi Arabia and Tarshish is Spain. With all the young lions thereof, not just these countries, in other words, these other Arabic nations as well. They asked the question, Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, and to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? In other words, they're trying to find out why they're justifying. They want to know what your justification is for invading Israel. Well, Russia will be in an alliance with them at that time because the Bible says all nations will come against Israel. They'll all come against them. I feel for my people in that day because it is coming on us very soon. But God does stand for us at that time. This will be when redemption comes to our people. 
How long will it be before this happens? I don't know. I do see a pause in here, though. They'll have all their militaries in. Maybe this is when your two witnesses begin the ministry. Or, you, or have they already began? I don't know the answer to that either. I don't think so. I think it's very close. There's going to be a little pause after this battle that takes place when Bashar al-Assad is overthrown. There's going to take a little pause in there. And all these countries will have their militaries there. And then after that pause, remember, look, look what it says. Thus saith the Lord God, verse 10, It shall also come to pass that at that same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. Remember, Russia signed an oil contract with Mahmoud Abbas, the West Bank. They're going to justify whatever they need to go in there and take to try to take the land from Israel. It's coming, friends. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. Listen again. We do need your help and support in making this ministry happen. We do a lot of traveling and are doing a lot more coming up very soon. Hopefully going into Israel. And I really want to get there to cover what's going on on the Syrian border and even the Lebanese border from some of the things that I hear that are going on there. But we can't do it without your support. We do know we have a lot of enemies. But I don't waste my time speaking about it. Because I know I'm on the right path. And God continues to lead me and reveal to me these great mysteries as we see even here with Ezekiel 38. I wonder at the time when the battle comes against Israel, if it's not going to be that Obama at that time will be the head of the United Nations. He very well may be by that moment. But remember, the main head of this all is none other than the Pope of Rome. He is using Erdogan, though, to galvanize the Arabic nations there to be part of this coalition against Israel. That's why I said the Pope has finally got their new man, their new Mahdi, to take the eyes off of the Vatican. Anyway, as I was stating, we do need your help and support. You can go to IsraeliNewsLive.org, contribute online, or again, IsraelReturns.com, and you can contribute there. It is definitely a blessing for us, and we could certainly use your help. You can mail us a check if you prefer to do that here in the Czech Republic, where our base is now. Shalom, and God bless you, and thank you for watching. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News.